Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for everybody uh, in the East Coast. Um, welcome to today's webinar on the Canada's Accessibilities Act, understanding the role of the Chief Accessibility Officer. We have an agenda today that includes uh, our featured speaker, Stephanie Cadu, and we have an update on the Disability Management Solutions Platform. My name is John Much. I'm the chair of the Canadian Society for Professionals and Disability Management, and I'm the senior director of the Return to Work program at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. So let's start with our featured speaker, Stephanie Cadu, who is the Chief Accessibility Officer. In May of 2022, Stephanie was appointed as the Canada's first Chief Accessibility Officer by the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion. Uh, Carla Quaftroff, as part of the federal government's commitment to implement the Accessible Canada Act. Ms. Cadu is a longtime advocate for accessibility, disability, inclusion, and diversity with more than 15 years of experience in planning and leadership roles. A former elected member of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia, she officially opened the Pacific Coast University for Workplace Health Science in Port Alberni. She is a member of the disability community, possessing extensive lived experience in government and as a person with disability. Let us welcome, with great honor, Stephanie Cadu. Thank you very much, John. Um, hello, bonjour. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish, particularly the Semiamu and Kwantlen First Nations. Uh, and Thank you for um, having me join you today. Um, it's great to have the opportunity uh, to share just a little bit uh, about uh, who I am, uh, how I got here, uh, and, and ultimately what my new role entails as Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer and how my office is going to contribute um, to the Accessible Canada Act's goal of a barrier-free Canada by 2040. Um, as disability management professionals, uh, I know that you're very familiar with the hard work of advocacy, uh, that you're no strangers to raising your voice, creating change, and tackling barriers that directly affect the lives of your clients and families, uh, even your own lives, perhaps. And I know that it isn't always easy work, but it also is work that can be deeply rewarding. So I want to start out by acknowledging and commending you for the work that you do. Helping to get people living with disabilities back to work or helping keep them at work or into the workforce for the first time uh, so that they're able to contribute everything they have to offer is honestly critical work. Not only do our economy and our culture benefit, but it adds meaning to people's lives. Wanting to work and not being able to because of barriers or because your organization wasn't able to understand or accommodate your needs is demoralizing and dehumanizing. And it's valuable for organizations who may not realize the benefits of inclusive and accessible workplaces uh, that still may view accommodating people with disabilities as a burden to have you there to help shift their expectations. Legislation is crucial, uh, but all too often simple changes or a willingness to ask a few more questions or have an in-depth and honest conversation would have made all the difference. And that's why shifting the culture and myth busting, changing the perceptions is such a big part of the work you're doing and the work I will do. So for those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure that is probably most, um, I've been working as an advocate throughout my career. Um, I've been around for a while now. I was injured when I was 18. Uh, having a spinal cord injury really set my life on a very different path than the one I had envisioned. But however different the path, it's been interesting nonetheless. I was an entrepreneur in the online retail space in the late 90s, which was definitely much too early. I was much ahead of my time. Um, but then I went to work for a not-for-profit agency, uh, which led me to uh, into uh, a role doing a lot of advocacy work for people with disabilities. I really sort of found my groove there. 
Um, and that led to provincial politics in BC. I served 13 years, seven of them at the cabinet table um, before this year being appointed as chief accessibility officer. So in a you know, 30 year career almost, uh, I, I've seen the conversation around disability change and progress. The Accessible Canada Act represents a huge commitment by our government, but not enough has changed. And there's a lot of work ahead of us to get where we need to be. The Act recognizes that all Canadians have the right to participate fully in society. And although that sounds self-evident, uh, you will know, it's still not the reality for people living with disabilities. Canada has a very robust human rights framework. Disability is a protected ground, but it's reactive, meaning that a person first has to be discriminated against, then they have to raise a complaint, then they have to fight to have it rectified. And this means that people with disabilities have to go through a very lengthy, cumbersome process time and time again as individuals when the problems that they're fighting and the solutions are large systemic. So the act takes the opposite approach, and this is quite revolutionary. It puts the onus on systems to proactively remove and prevent the barriers. The goal of the act is to make Canada barrier-free by January 1st, 2040. This involves identifying, removing, and preventing barriers in all areas of federal jurisdiction in seven priority areas, including employment. Uh, the six other areas, of course, have direct impact on a person's ability to be employed. So, for example, the built environment. Uh, if the correct technology isn't there, that poses a barrier. So technology, transportation, uh, or something as basic as parking. If it isn't accessible, it makes getting in the next door impossible. So for reference, the seven areas uh, are employment, the built environment, buildings and public spaces. Uh, information and communication technology, communication, which is other than information technology, uh, the procurement of goods, services, and facilities, the design and delivery of programs and services, and transporta or transportation, where it crosses borders, so airlines, uh, railroad, and marine that cross provincial or international borders. Now, nothing exists in isolation, and all of these priorities are interconnected which will add complexity to the Act's implementation. And it's gonna make cohesion and oversight necessary as literally thousands of departments and federally regulated organizations address their responsibilities under the new regulations. So my office is housed within Employment and Social Development Canada. My mandate is to act as a special independent advisor to the minister. Uh, with support from my office, a small but mighty office, I'll be reporting on the progress made under the Act and any challenge or impediments to that to success uh, in reaching that barrier-free 2040 goal and any emerging issues with regards to accessibility. It is an ever-changing and highly variable landscape, as you will know, and I'll be working to ensure that nothing gets missed. I am very much hoping to act as a catalyst inside the federal structures to be able to help them solve perceived problems uh, that arise as agencies work to dismantle barriers and as they sort of find their way. It's an important part of the work, uh, promoting conversations around accessibility, raising the profile of the issue in public discourse, and having discussions like this one today um, with both public and private audiences. In the simplest of terms, though, I will be a champion and a challenger for this work. So um, to cover a little bit of definitions for context, uh, the Accessible Canada Act defines disability as any impairment, including physical, mental, intellectual, cognitive, learning, communication, or sensory impairment, or a functional limitation, whether permanent, temporary, or episodic in nature, or evident or not, that in interaction with a barrier hinders a person's full and equal participation in society. It's a mouthful and it's a lot for people to take in. But the reality is that the whole spectrum of disability is represented in the Canadian workforce. You'll know this. With 22% of Canadians currently living with disabilities and in aging populations who will likely acquire disabilities as they progress in their careers, removing barriers to full participation is the only way forward. 
And the biases that we hold, both as individuals and as organizations, affect how we approach accessibility and inclusion and how we see or don't see uh, the barriers. And the barriers in the act by definition are anything including anything physical, architectural, technological, or attitudinal, anything that's based on information or communications, or anything that is the result of a policy or practice that hinders the full and equal participation of, of people with disability or people with an impairment, including physical, mental, intellectual, cognitive learning, communication, or sensory impairments, or a functional limitation. So it really shifts the whole, the whole thing on its head. It's not about uh, it's not about what the disability is. It's about what the barrier is. So accessibility, therefore, is the essential is essentially the removing of all of those barriers. It's ensuring that the built environment, the culture, the policies, the products provide equal access regardless of disability. And in many ways, that sounds simple, uh, but as you know, it isn't. Uh, because we also have to change very entrenched mindsets and perceptions about disability. The medical model uh, that we are all used to frames disability as a physical or mental limitation, and it assumes that it's the person's own actions and self-advocacy that are the solutions to improving their experience. But the social model that we're moving to posits that a disability is the result of the environment or the attitude or the social norms that are unwelcoming to the range of people's physical and mental abilities. In other words, in an inclusive world, differing abilities cease to be a determining factor when it comes to full participation in society. Solutions are about removing both individual and systemic barriers. Attitudinal barriers are gonna be the hardest and the most important to remove in many ways. So building a diverse team, whether it's a diverse workforce uh, or in a diverse workforce uh, um, is probably harder now than it's ever been in some ways because we're all hearing it, we're seeing it. Employers are experiencing a human resources crunch. Uh, no industry is exempt. My office <laughs> is not exempt. It's, it's, it's a challenge to staff up right now. Employers are being forced to rethink their workplaces and hiring strategies. I think this time of change though, can also be embraced as an opportunity. People with disabilities are the largest untapped resource in the Canadian labor market. And too often they are forgotten in diversity hiring campaigns. Bringing the values, uh, these values to life goes far beyond HR. Uh, it's wonderful if someone with a disability is hired or someone from a diverse background. But if managers and coworkers don't also have an inclusive mindset, then the experience at work isn't going to be good and those employees aren't gonna stay. This might be especially pertinent when it comes to new hires because there are, but actually, uh, since people acquire disabilities as they age, as all of you will know, chances are that workplaces are losing employees because they're not adequately accommodating those changing needs. Or some of those employees may not even know what their own changing needs are or how they could be accommodated. And this is a huge drain on talent and potentially on work culture if other employees watch other colleagues suffer in the process. So disability inclusion is more than adding people with disabilities to the workforce. It's actually a cultural shift that prioritizes creating an environment where every employee can perform and reach their highest potential. It's shifting that mindset uh, that is hands down the biggest challenge. Attitudes and unconscious bias run very deep. And what is unconscious by definition is hard to recognize and even harder to change. There are really great training materials on unconscious bias, but people have to take that training. They have to reflect, and then they have to live that change in their thoughts and behaviors. Doing the work is not a small task and it's not something that can be just checked off the list. So while the duty to accommodate is real and we're, and we're used to that language, if you think about how it sounds, it sounds like, well, I have to do this, but I don't really want to. And what we have to do is shift that around to, we want you here, what can we do to make you feel welcome and to do your job most effectively? And that is a culture shift. So 
I'm very keen to counter the idea that work is irrelevant to anyone who isn't currently living with a disability or caring for someone who does, because this work is everyone's business. It isn't a niche issue. Making our workplaces more accessible will benefit everybody. For starters, it's the right thing to do, um, but it's gonna to contribute to creating kinder, more compassionate and humane work cultures, cultures that value human dignity and recognize that people are indeed our most valuable resource. But on a purely pragmatic level, there's also a strong business case. And organizations with inclusive cultures are quite simply more successful when it comes to profitability, performance, innovation, agility, and employee satisfaction. In the current work climate, employee satisfaction and decreased turnover matter more than ever. An inclusive workforce has that innovation advantage because people with disabilities have to find alternative paths to accomplish common tasks every day. They are forced to innovate constantly. They are often innovators by necessity, and that's a skill that can translate to the creation of new processes, products, and services. It's kind of infectious. So as a society, we need that innovation. We've reached a moment heightened by COVID-19 where conversation about a shared future is ripe uh, and we all want to change. Some of the things that we need to change though are big and difficult. And even though we want to, and even though we think we're comfortable with it, it won't happen overnight and some of it will be uncomfortable. Will we have the patience and persistence required to see that change come over the long term? Well, I'm determined uh, that I will. And I want to help inspire that in you to help everyone I meet and have the opportunity I speak with to think about this as a huge opportunity. As service providers, uh, I know you're probably face daily situations where you have to advocate for your clients or for yourselves. And you likely have insights and experience from uh, that your communities stand to learn uh, and benefit a great deal from if they take the time to listen. So I encourage you to keep raising those issues, continue advocating, have those hard conversations, encourage your clients to have those hard conversations. The systems really do need our help. They aren't gonna change on their own. Not giving up is a part of my job. I hope you'll join me in that effort. When we get exhausted and frustrated, let's remember that possibility, uh, the possibility is there and keep working barrier by barrier. We're going to make progress. Uh, we are making progress and we have to keep building on that momentum. We have to flip the script once and for all. As a culture, and as a society, we have to stop accommodating inaccessibility. Rather than thinking of accessibility as a burden, we have to look at inaccessibility as the burden, as a factor that is costing us far too much and preventing far too many people from achieving their full potential, from participating fully in society, from preventing far too much innovation, connection, and progress from happening. I know that you're all too familiar with what can be lost when everyone isn't included. I encourage you to join me in advocating for a world in which anything that isn't accessible is quite frankly, just simply wrong. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, thank you for your interest uh, in the work that I am setting out to do uh, with our government. And I hope you'll be a part of that. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was so informative. And I can see from the, the emojis going up, the thumbs up and the claps that you've inspired. I know you've inspired me, but I know you've inspired the membership. And I think we'll go on with that message because I think there's a lot of good stuff that you said and um, going forward. So thank you so much for your time today and inspiring us. Thank you. Lanny, would you like to take over the agenda now? I did. I didn't know if Stephanie was open to a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <that's okay. laughs> I don't know if the, if Sorry, the... if you have questions, if you want to put them in the chat, um, and we'll monitor the chat. Um, Can I throw one out while we... Sure. While we Sorry. <laughs> um, no, you know, you're, the word you said, infectious, I... I just kind of, it, it really resonated with me about this, 
the potential being infectious and and um and so thank you for for that as well and the other thing that i kept thinking about is your you know duty accommodate being reactive versus um proactive and how many times we we get into a a challenge about arguing what's hardship or not like that undue hardship yeah. right so um but what i was wondering about is is does your office have will you be involved in the discussions around um the canada disability act or pardon me benefit at all is that part of your uh, I, like you said, right. everything is kind of muddy and mixed up together. But I was just wondering if that's something you might be overseeing. I'm not overseeing it. Or it's not very overseeing it. <laughs> at the policy level. Um, is that the, you know, that, that's government's um, domain. Uh, that said, um, the, dis the, the potential for the disability benefit, what it looks like, et cetera, is very much a, a topic of conversation in the disability community broadly. And uh, I am having uh, conversations with the disability community uh, broadly, um, so it comes up. Uh, certainly, I am not unaware of, uh, of what it means to the community, uh, what the challenges are. Um, having been a legislator uh, who very much worked on this file, um, I, know, I know what the challenges are with uh, bringing, it, uh, bringing it to bear nationally. Um, excited for it. Uh, but no, I'm not directly involved. Um, I can share things I hear with the minister, uh, but uh, but frankly, it's moving along uh, sort of on its own path. Thank you. We have a question from Julie. The question is, what supports for employers do you feel would be most effective to help them shift? You talked about that attitude shift that needs to happen. Gosh, if I only knew. Um, <laughs> yeah, no magic bullet yeah, there, Steph. Yeah, yeah, well, oh gosh. You know, this is the challenge, right? I mean, it's sort of a one by one by one. It's it's not something I, I, I don't think we can just hand them a document and say, here, this is how you do it. Um, changing, changing the attitudes is so deep. I mean, the, the reality is most corporations, most employers, most most CEOs, and I've had... I've been doing work with them for years, um, you know, understand they want to do this. They think they're doing it. They've got the policy in place that says we're a diverse and inclusive employer. And here, you know, we will, we welcome everyone. And then it just doesn't happen. Um, by the time it trickles down and, and what have you, it doesn't happen. I have a lot of theories about that. I don't have any um, magic bullets or, or, or what have you, but I keep challenging um, organizations to really look deeply at are they how what a, what a, how are they ensuring that their hiring processes are inclusive um, how are they including those those employees with disabilities what how are they reacting right in that duty to accommodate I really do think it's unfortunately it's just going to be those conversations one by one it's going to be the examples that that we continue to put forward um, it's it's going to be the the campaigns or, or what have you that continue. And there's lots of good work going on across the country. Um, but it is, it is challenging. I do think we have to challenge people uh, to change their minds. And I'm going to give you an example uh, to, to illustrate. One of the things that I, I keep challenging employers with is, well, are you really? Right. Because I, I know people that are people with disabilities, some of those 645,000 people in Canada that are sitting on the sidelines just waiting to get in. 50% of those people have a post secondary education. In some cases, they have a very advanced post secondary education. They're not getting in the door. Why? What is it about that hiring process that's preventing people from getting in the door? Do you realize that this person applied to your company and has not been given? an interview and they're like, what? You know, the reality is that until you can point to the exact problem, it's very difficult for people to understand that it's not happening. Um, and until you can ask them the question of, you know, well, how would you, how would you accommodate this person? This person has, you know, speaks three languages, has an HR degree and a diploma. Um, 
but they have a speech impediment, which makes it difficult for them to talk on the phone. Do you understand how to accommodate that person in your organization? And people are really uncomfortable with that. They're uncomfortable realizing that they're uncomfortable. But until we do that, until we sort of challenge those uh, situations um, and, and make them kind of think, oh, well, how would we do it? What do you, how? And then I say, well, I've done it in my own, in my own environment. I, I altered a job. It really wasn't that difficult. We transferred one, one task to someone else and, and a task to the new person, something they could do. It's not difficult, but it takes intent. And um, we have to keep challenging people one by one. And that's challenging for people with disabilities because they're exhausted advocating for themselves. Um, and probably you are exhausted advocating for your clients. Um, for the little changes that would make all the difference. So one by one, you are very much a part of this work. You're very much part of changing those, those opinions. We have a question from Ontario. Uh, how are you tracking changes in the systems? Are there mechanisms to support identifying issues that can be negatively impacting helping workers return to work? Well, honestly, much of my first year is going to be setting a baseline from which to measure. The reality is the data doesn't really exist anywhere. The data on disability is really weak. Um, the data on accessibility is really weak. There's gaps all over the place. So, you know, we're really, we know things anecdotally. We don't necessarily know them. Uh, in, in numbers, in, in fact. Um, so it's gonna be hard to change or track changes um, and, and measure things if we don't know where we're starting from. So part of my first year is to sort of figure out how to set that baseline as a, and again, of course, that's within the structures of the federal government. Um, but uh, I, ideally, yes, what we are gonna be tracking is the changes and some of them will be easier easier to see um we'll know if if a policy change has been made and we'll be able to track that we'll know if a a new system is rolled out um, so we are going to be trying to track that we're looking at all of those barriers right now in terms of the barriers to us tracking um, so it's part of the work in the first year, setting an office up from scratch, um, setting a, not only my office, but of course the commissioner um, is, is setting out to his work. Um, and he's, the difference is he's the monitor and com monitoring compliance guy. And I'm just the sort of overall cohesion, keep track of everything person. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of moving parts right now. We're sort of figuring out who's going to do what, um, and that'll be the first years of work. But what I can tell you is there's a lot of energy and excitement in the federal government about this. A lot of people that are really committed to doing this work. It's really about now changing the intent and the ideas into actions. Um, and we're, I'm really, I'm really hopeful about it. Um, and I'm, because the, the work extends into the public or the private sector through the banks, the telecoms uh, and some of the transportation companies and things. Um, and we're seeing uh, in some of those cases, uh, they're further ahead than the federal government. I think there's a, a lot of cross-pollination that we can do over the first couple of years. I don't see any more questions. So, oh, there's one more from Jeannie. Um, many supervisors feel that the duty to accommodate is a task or a chore they need to check off. I think you mm. were talking about that. Definitely yeah. a culture shift in the workplace needs to take place. I guess it's more of a comment. Yeah, I, I, it is. And, and I agree. It's, it is that change, right? We say we, we say we want to do it. We say we want people there. But then when it comes when those people come to the door and it doesn't just go with the same way it used to, um, it's like, oh, oh, well, right? Um, and, and I think part of that is, part of that is just structural. It's just, 
you know, because there's budgets and we're this going to take away from something else and I've got, don't have time. And some of it is, is that attitude that somebody is less capable because they have a disability. And there's, there's two pieces we have to shift all at once. Um, but because of the act, the act now shifting to that, preventing the barrier in the first place, um, hopefully through the federal structures, we're going to see uh, that shift happen first and sort of model for other employers outside the federal system, um, how you do that. And hopefully we're, we'll see that that same uh, proactive barrier removal is going to happen um, through the provinces and the municipalities and you know, filter, filter through to the private sector um, because everybody has to come along on this journey or we're not gonna have that barrier-free Canada. People don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, yay, I'm really looking forward to interacting with my federal government today. Glad it's accessible. Um, you know, it's not how we work, right? We get up in the morning and we say, hmm, where am I going for lunch with my friend? Or, you know, I got to go get groceries. Uh, what a chore. But those are the things that people are going to really notice if things are changing or not. And so we have to get there. Um, and, I, and I feel we will. There's a lot of momentum. Um, the provinces are at the table. Um, they're following sort of suit and, and building alliances to make sure that standards are the same. So I, I really do think after 30 years um, that we are at a pivotal moment for change and, and that culture will come with that. Um, but I am, I am a realist. It won't happen overnight. And we're going to have to, in the plans that folks are going to put forward, we're going to see sort of staging of things. It's not going to happen overnight. But for me, the employment piece is key because I believe that if people with disabilities are, are there, uh, the culture change comes with them as well. They become a, a valued part of that culture um, as there are more supervisors, as there are more leaders with disabilities. Those folks underneath who are hiring have a harder time seeing a barrier because if they're their boss has a barrier that they've overcome, then why wouldn't that next person? Um, I really think that visibility is hugely important um, and visibility in management is hugely important for this to, for this to change. Okay, I just see one more question, Stephanie, and it's, can we get in touch with Stephanie? Of course you can. Um, I, you, you have my email address, Right, so I'm sure you can share that out. Um, we've got social media channels open now. Um, we're working on a website. Like I say, things are slow. A, it's the federal government, which I'm learning is not ultimately really fast, um, but it's also just a, a lack of, of uh, manpower at this point um, for us. But we've got uh, LinkedIn, um, both uh, the office has a LinkedIn page as well as I do personally. Um, Facebook, Twitter, I don't recommend Twitter. Um, but yes, by all means, reach out, happy to connect. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting and, uh, and continue doing the great work you do to help us uh, get in, stay in, get in and stay in the workplace. It's really important. That was fantastic. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I guess, John, over to me then. Excellent. You know, and so building off of what Stephanie has said and, and her in enthusiasm, and um, I'm excited to, to talk to you and introduce you guys to our new platform, which is officially having a soft launch as of today. Uh, and you're a part of that. It's called the DM Solutions Platform. And it's really about being able to connect as a, a group of professionals, as a community of practice to support each other. We're across the country. Uh, we, we do a lot of this work independently or in isolation. And uh, so we're gonna talk to you a bit about this platform and I'm gonna switch over to some notes here just so I get this right. And I'm gonna um, introduce uh, our presenter on, uh, on this 
this issue and then um, give you a little bit of background and then I'll hand over to Dave to, to do a walkthrough, a uh, short walkthrough and let you know about next steps. So I'm really uh, pleased to, to welcome Dave Hill, who's the founder of Timed Right. Uh, Dave has been a management consultant to numerous health organizations and has worked in senior project and marketing roles with GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca. A professional engineer, he founded Timed Right in 2007 and brought it to life based on his vision of an online platform where people from all areas of healthcare can, can connect and work together in a safe, secure, and controlled space. Timed Right is a Canadian-based company trusted by healthcare professionals as an online space where they can share network information, or pardon me, share information, network with peers, and we can host events. For the CSPDM, it is a secure and private site that allows us to connect as a community of practice to build our relationships, enhance our learning through discussion, education, and virtual events. So a little bit about what we've done. So as, as the, the board and uh, working with NIDMAR, we uh, have, have been working with Timed Right to develop the platform specific for CSPDM. Uh, we are, this is to encourage the development and implementation of innovative, successful accommodation, advanced thought leadership and creative best practice outcomes. NIDMAR is applying funding received from the federal government and the BC government to launch DM Solutions. And uh, like I said, with Timed Right, which is again, a Canadian company creating the private communications platform for for healthcare professionals and, and for us. Um, I think I just wanna reinforce that this is a private site. We've worked really closely with, with Timed Right to figure out a solution to make sure that uh, as you're signing in, um, we're, it's, it's through yourself volunteering to participate in the program. We've not uh, sent over any, any emails, information, your private information, but we're gonna talk to you how you sign up, how you do that. And then the site is, again, for CSPDM members and, and secure. And so I'm really excited to invite Dave uh, to join us here and, and walk through and introduce you to the platform. And then afterwards, we'll let you know about next steps on, on how to, to join. Thanks, Dave. That's great. Thanks, Lanny. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, the time. And uh, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to do is just take, I guess, everybody here, I'm going to take sort of three, four minutes just to give you a sense of who we are, because I think it's important that obviously you uh, trust of any of these types of platforms is is key. Um, and I'll, so I'll walk you through briefly what, you know, what time right is, that'll be sort of a two minute thing. Then I'm going to take you through uh, sort of a quick look at what the community will look like. And then I'm going to kind of explain a little bit of the platform. And then the last, I'm just going to take you through how you join, um, which isn't uh, hard at all. The soft launch is a little bit, um, it's not hard. I mean, you can just go to actually a URL in the end, but uh, what's key, there's a couple of steps in the soft launch that will be uh, smoothed out for the, for the complete launch, which I understand will be in January. So let me uh, just start there. And um, first of all, share my screen. I'm just going to make sure I can, everybody can see. Um, I guess uh, my my presentation deck, which is great. I'm sure it's showing now. Perfect. So, um, so Time Bright, as Lenny mentioned, has been around for a while. Even though I did start in 2000, we actually didn't. Uh, it was sort of like a, a side thing at the time. We actually sort of fully launched around 2012. So we've been around sort of active in the commercial and what uh, environment for about 10 years. Um, now and uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's doing quite well. We're you know utilized by numerous organizations across Canada, um, actually, and also spreading now into the U.S. and the U.K., which is great. But um, yeah, the the platform really was designed with this vision to create people from all parts of the health or to connect people from all parts of healthcare, as Lanny mentioned. And today, it really is the leading network of this type uh, in Canada, providing these sort of safe, secure, compliant healthcare communities where different organizations or different groups effectively different groups or community groups uh, of individuals can be brought together in one large environment to connect and so whether you're you know an organization needs to connect a small group be 25 30 50 or something or they want to connect 500 or a thousand 
<laughs> it's uh, you know it really is designed to do that and to do that all on the same platform and then allow people to you know simplify obviously your communications and knowledge exchange like sharing files stuff you're probably familiar with if you're familiar with other online platforms and you know obviously allow the increased engagement and time rate really is designed to be obviously sort of provide for engagement sort of light constant connection so it's not meant to be sort of a full-on collaborative site where you can share and like work on files together that's not what we're trying to do what we're trying to do is allow you to share share files of course so you can read them and engage with each other on that but it's sort of at a, at a higher level because obviously we want you know we that's that seems to be where the gap is in healthcare obviously uh, allowing you know siloed organizations and siloed groups of people to share with others um, is difficult, um, certainly in the Canadian healthcare system, which is, uh, you know, we, in every healthcare system, actually everywhere, which is, uh, you know, they're all quite solid and can be difficult to um, engage with each other. So that was the real focus there. Um, today, you know, time rate is used by lots of organizations, as I mentioned, they get you, it gets used for all sorts of different rings of things. And as Nidmar has set up their own community inside time rate, I mean, Currently, they're going to use it for a community practice, as you know, so it'll be for all of you to join uh, and sort of participate in and, you know, engage with each other, network, ask questions. Nidmar also will, you know, uh, provide a lot of information through the community to you, and then you can have discussions about that information that's being provided really easily. Um, and so, you know, that's just what, sort of one key use. So today it is getting used for lots of different things, sort of boards, committees, insight, focus groups, community practice. All these items are kind of coming up here. A lot of education goes out through time rate, um, sort of via either integrated webinar because we integrate with Zoom, or maybe something like a learning program because there is a learning program plugin. So if you you know with modules and things like that that can be uh, walked through asynchronously, it's sort of at your own at your own time if you want. So those kinds of capabilities are available in time rate. But for the outset and for this launch, and initially, it's really just, you know, a community practice for you to engage with each other and chat and, um, you know, learn about new information that DM, uh, that DM Solutions wants to sort of roll out to you, you know, providing a, uh, you know, a place where you can ask questions to each other, all those types of things. So what I'm, what does this mean for you, though? I mean, again, the key things that it's going to do is it's providing this group space, you know, private space for members only, you can have discussions, share files, link share. And then there's integrated events in that group so you can have events like uh you know there could be a number of events sort of posted there and um, that you can register for going forward it's easy to explore different events that kind of thing and then you'll be kept up to date really easily about new happenings new information because notifications will go out to you automatically in a lot of cases and then there's something called digest that go out um i, I believe they're set up to go out probably every couple of weeks initially um, but those can be adjusted and um, you know, you can, that obviously the digest kind of gives a summary of what's happening in your community. So sort of the latest you know, discussions being shared, you know, latest files, that kind of thing. So pretty, you know, pretty straightforward to, and similar to other communities that like, probably exist like this or do exist like this in sort of more of a consumer environment. It's just that time has spent a lot of time trying to make it as focused on healthcare as possible so that you have a lot of control around the borders of each group community and things like that, who could see those communities and that kind of thing. Obviously privacy and compliance in healthcare really is a critical element. Um, today, the network, just so you can have some, I guess, trust level again, this is really just to, you know, ensure that we're not, you know, that we've been around. Uh, time rate's fairly large, 26,000 users plus. Our biggest sort of clients tend to be in, in the diabetes space today, actually, and we also, are sort of the, the primary um, provider for the College of Family Physicians to Canada. So they've got, you know, several thousands of physicians on the network and that's growing every day. Um, and actually they've just entered into uh, another multi-year arrangement with us. So that'll continue ongoing. Uh, so why don't I just give you a quick walkthrough? I think I'll just stop the share and then share uh, my, um, just a picture of your of your community so you know what it looks like. And then I'll give you a walkthrough of the actual, um, make sure it's sharing properly, yeah, of the actual sort of how you join, which is uh, very fast. And then if there are any questions, it's straightforward. So your community will look like this when you go into it. I'll walk through the entrance process in a minute, but of course, um, time right has sort of a, uh, this black banner across the top, which really is where you control all your own things because time right itself is one big community. Remember, there are other communities in there. So if you happen to be somebody that belongs to which I'm not sure if many here would, 
but you know, perhaps you belong to another community that's in time, right? And if you wanted to access that, you you could by just clicking the groups to go to all of your groups, which could be, you know be you, the DM Solutions community, and others could be presented there. So maybe something from I don't know, uh, the, uh, you know, can can you network respiratory care, or if you happen to be, belong to if you happen to be a GP and happen to belong to one of the college family physician groups or something like that, that would be listed there. Um, but everything under the black banner is really where um, uh, you know DM Solutions resides and what's critical to you. So if, when you come in here, you can kind of see the key things happening in the community. There's obviously a big welcome message that's here now. Um, that won't be here forever, but that's probably going to be here for at least the next you know few weeks. Um, but you can just scroll down and see kind of the various things that they're offering here. These are sort of the static offerings right now, but you know we they, you know, it's important to kind of start somewhere get people understanding that you can see the latest group activity also happening below that. If you want to go to where the sort of the, the meat and potatoes of these communities is, you click this content area. Um, so again, it's this little content button here and you can just go in to look at all the discussions and file shares that could be happening at any point in time. Um, so we obviously started doing a few things in here ages ago. We were kind of uh, talking when we first kicked this off. So, you know, some older stuff in here, but when you guys come in over the next little bit, you're going to see more obviously new, um, discussions and those when somebody starts a discussion or if you would like to start a discussion which feel free you just come into this dm solutions area and you click start discussion type your topic um, pick a category that you might be interested in in you know um, placing in here and then which the categories are set by the team actually and then you just post your question or you know what you'd like to say and click start discussion and that will be that'll be going to everybody initially um we're, i'm just going to let everybody know because this is important um so, sort of sort of for the feel of how you're getting communicated with we we will have this sort of default check mark on here at the bottom where it says would you like to notify all members we will default that on so that it's really just to remind people initially that the community exists because <laughs> believe it or not these types of things we've, we've launched a lot of these over the years and if you don't kind of keep in people's ears initially they just forget about it um but uh, of course you know by clicking that that means everybody in the community would get notified of that message but over time we'll probably remove that because we wouldn't need to and the digest would keep people up to speed if people just come in on their own and explore the community um but it's pretty straightforward to share you know discussion or sorry to start a discussion or if you want to share content you can just drag and drop items in or share links and things like that yeah it's uh, very simple to use um easy to use um and yeah they there is an, uh, an ios app right now and our android app is being re reconfigured so um that's going to be happening over the next little bit but uh the ios app is out there right now um easy to use for that and yeah and like i said the android app is just being reconfigured right now and so that's happening in the next short term um just to walk you through how do you get in because uh the team has said they want to do this soft launch which is great um for the soft launch it is a little bit different um uh than what might be there in the long term but it's pretty still pretty straightforward so how do you get involved with this right so you you'll get an invite to the community <laughs> from from the team um that'll have a link that'll take you basically it's uh dm uh the, the link um i, I believe is dmsolutions.timerate.com <laughs> so um yeah you'll be able to basically go to that link um you'll see an entrance page that looks just like this everyone so uh, if you don't see that you're not in the right space so it looks like this where i'm hovering my cursor over and you'll want to if you're not a time rate member I, I i some of you might be um it's though so i i'm not sure how many of you might be involved in other communities right but if, you know, obviously if you're not you'll need to create an account on our platform um so you just click this not a member yet uh button and create an account um you just simply provide your email and password as um lanny said no, none of your emails have been provided to us we've set up a different access uh, method which is uh, available the time right where you know we can just allow for access codes to be entered um, and so they will explain that to you um obviously your access codes um will be provided or or some sort of i'll let them just go through how what, what the access codes codes will be with you um but um, you'll enter that access code and entry and i'll show you that in a minute so first of all though you need to register on the platform um, you'll need to accept the time right membership agreement um, just to be on the platform uh, sort of standard, I'm sure, as you all know, just standard things that go on with uh, the Internet, because um, we need to be able to move your information around on the Internet. And that's the key thing, obviously, uh, uh, just even displaying something somewhere else uh, requires us to get the authorization from from people. Um, so that's so you'll need to agree to that. 
then you will get a registration link from us. So just as whatever um, email you registered with, you'll be sent a registration link. So you'll need to go to your email and click that to verify that, that it's you that is registered so that somebody can't steal your email um, and use that. Um, the registration link uh, email or verification email looks just like this, or you know, it's a simple, um, a very simple email like these are not always meant to be. Um, so you click that, um, it look this little link right here, as this button says, and you'll get taken to a page where you can fill out your profile. Um, fill out a little bit of this information if you like, as much or as little as you don't, uh, as you want, but uh, I would just encourage you to fill, uh, you know, some definitely uh, as much as you can, because trust is sort of key to these types of communities. So any kind of online community and people that have, um, profile information there so that others can see sort of who you are and what, you know, your information is, it naturally, you know, creates a, lot, a higher level of trust amongst all the, all the members. Um, <clears throat> one key thing, so for the soft launch though, you won't get taken directly to your community yet. So if you, if from that profile page, you would need to go back to your email um, and click the, the invitation email again, or you'll have to go back to, or just go to dmsolutions.timedrate.com. And that's just um, something that we're just finishing over the next uh, couple of weeks to make sure that that going from that profile page directly into the community um, happens. It's because we have so many different communities on time, right? That's a, a sort of a new thing we're doing. Um, and because we didn't know who you were on entry, as I mentioned, because your emails have not been provided to us, we can't just take anybody into that community. Um, so that's that's the reason that's like that. Um, so right now uh, you would need to, once you've done your profile there, you'd wanna go back, just go to dmsolutions.timedread.com again, or go back into your email and re-click the link and that's it. It would be taken to your community, enter your access code, which is super easy. Uh, just type it right in here, click accept and join. Um, that's where the Sarah is. You just type it right in there and that's it. You're all set. And then you can enjoy the community. And uh, if you have uh, any issues or questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, there'll be a, a, um, some information in the email invitation that you're sent out, you know, how to ask um, either the team, um, you know, the team, the, like Lenny's team or, you know, us, uh, both, all of us can help you. It's a long story short, like feel free to, if, there's, if you're just somewhere on time, right? And you want to contact us, you can do that. Um, or if you want to reach out, um, you know, via the invitation, sort of replying directly to the invitation or anything like that, that'll work too. So you know, there's lots of ways to get help if you have any questions. So thanks, Lanny. Is, uh, is there anything else you'd like me to go over quickly? No, I think that's great, Dave. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think it's good to to see the, the site itself. So just so folks know, we'll be sending out, we'll send you an email um, over the next couple of days, either to, I don't know, it's Thursday, Friday or, or Monday, I think. Uh, will come from from us with the instructions and, and an invitation and, and how to do that. The access code will be your CSPDM membership number. Okay, and so uh, that was the design we created so that we could maintain um, your, your privacy, but also then ensure that it's a private site. So that's how we know that only members of the CSPDM uh, will be on this site. Uh, so. Um, we're excited about it. It's it's a it's it's something that is going to evolve and build as as we participate in it. So we have a, the have the framework, and now um, we get to to create this this network and and reach out and um, uh, yeah and and really support each other in this this work that we do. So uh, thank you, Timed Right, and your your colleague Roshni, yeah, no who's been such a help to us as well. And like I said, there'll, there'll be lots of help. You'll get the instructions, not to worry. Um, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that and we'll hand it back to John. Oh, oh sorry, Dave, did you have Absolutely. one more? No, no, that oh. was it. I just said, you know, I enjoy everybody. And um, I will just say, everybody give it time. These communities do take time to grow. That's really a key thing. And I actually, I've never said that to a membership group before, but I'm gonna take the opportunity to say that because obviously I'm obviously saying it to the teams that are building these communities all the time. They, they do take time to grow and nurture. Um, so, you know, obviously, and what you'll find is that some members will come in and be really excited and help each other. And that's great. And those people are amazing because they really help build these communities. Like they help get them going. So just to give everyone, give it time and it'll, it'll pay off. I think it's a really good foundation and really good start to build from. So thank you, Dave.
Uh, so thanks everybody no for joining today. Um, hope you found Stephanie to be inspiring. So in 2023, look for more of these types of webinars going forward. We'll have a, a roadmap for um, that coming out probably in early June, January, sorry. And then uh, with the full launch of this, uh, the solutions platform will be exciting too. So um, enjoy your holidays, be safe, and we will be in contact with you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.